All right, so uh, welcome everybody to the session um, about um, demonstrators. So we have uh, in Onto Commons today um, about one and a half hours to discuss how to use ontologies uh, in uh, different application fields. And particularly, um, well, my, my name is Tana Fenzel and I'm chairing uh, this session here. So we um, have uh, this following agenda. Uh, first, we have uh, three presentations, uh, which will show particular details about uh, demonstrators and um, how ontologies are being used. And uh, there was already a FAIR session, session about FAIR technologies, which you may have been before lunch, chaired by my colleague and uh, Umuchan Simsek. And um, here we, we are more discussing uh, practical issues, well, which have to do with general issues of ontology use, not only on FAIR data. And we have uh, three demonstrators. Uh, so the one from, well, two, two first demonstrators are from, uh, at least on the agenda, are from um, already on the Commons partners from Bosch and from Technicar and a uh, demonstrator from Bosch will be on um, showing how the um, ontologies are being used in um, uh, manufacturing and demonstrator from Technica will go into material um, uh, science or material uh, science kind of production and uh, use of ontologies there and um, presentations from Jasper, a co-host from Wageningen University of Research and, and Research will be on uh, showing the toolkit and uh, enabler on how to make uh, data, particular research data, um, semantic and fair. Uh, in between of every demonstrator, we have possibility to ask questions and uh, answers. And uh, also we have a discussion at the end um, of the presentation. Now we have a kind of a small agenda change, so we don't have the exact order. So we will start with Iker, um, and then we go to Jasper, and then we go to Evgenia because he had some issues and he will join a few minutes later. So for the uh, session, we, uh, well, as you already know, the project is recording these sessions and um, for our having purposes, because we also use this kind of sessions to get additional feedback and insight on the field, uh, the work we are doing. And um, well, you can, uh, when you have any questions at any point of time, you can type them in the chat and um or in, in questions and answers and you when there are any comments you can uh, type them in the chat so this is uh, how we will proceed ah, actually Evgeny is here so i think we can just follow the order yeah. right mm -hmm. yes yes sorry so what we do Okay, that's better because maybe somebody wants to go between the sessions. Okay, then you're good. I suggest we start uh, directly then with Evgeny and um, but he shows what he what the demonstrator is doing. I will I stop my screen sharing. Hmm. Let me start the screen sharing. And you see my screen? Uh, yes. <clears throat> right. Measuring the impact of industrial ontology application. Um, so today, what in, in this short talk, what I will say is how can we understand that ontologies, they do make uh, some difference in industrial applications and how we would like to do it. So in the current use cases we have in Onto Commons, um, we are still developing the use cases and the, the project is, is lasting for three years and we are getting ready to show the real impact uh, with Bosch and other use cases. So what I would like to show today um, is the few use cases cases where the impact has been really astonishing, so with really, really strong impact, and that can, um, can show what we can expect from ontology applications in, in, in the use cases of 
um, Ubuntu commands. So let's just give me a couple of examples. Um, these examples, they are coming from the experience of my project that I was involved in or from other colleagues with whom, who, from, from the Serious Research Center at the University of, of Oslo and other interesting use cases that, that I know about. Um, so there will be a sequence of use cases. So ABLE, it's a really nice example where uh, the company builds oil platforms these huge beasts and they use semantic technologies to enhance design like this 3d design of um, of, of those platforms and there um, the design goes down from hours and days so and the design goes down and they save for hours and day on this design and verification so whenever you construct such a um, such a 3d design you can click verification button and since there is an since there is an ontology behind this design um, the system can automatically derive for you various aspects various um, conform to international standards so this is a really nice way of saving a lot of time in the design and in the verification Another example uh, is from Statoil or Equinor, the new name of the company. They use platforms, well, some of them built by Able, some of them built by other companies. And there, uh, the, until the, there is one of the issues is the data access challenge, where the data is in various databases. For example, there is a big database with 700 terabytes developed for many years with thousands of tables and, and tens of thousands of columns. Accessing this data is really challenging. And in order to find something in this database, it can a lot, it, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, with the help of ontologies, layer it on top of this database, or the Schlegger huge database, one could get access to this data much faster. So the data access went from days to hours. This is the really the real big impact um, that, that that has been done, and one can get these beautiful um, diagrams or dead diagrams through this uh, through this ontology based access. Another example is from Siemens, um, where the idea is, was to um, improve. Um, diagnostics of turbines with the help of semantic technologies. So remote diagnostics of complex equipment like turbines went from hours to minutes. Uh, one can write diagnostic tasks, reuse diagnostic tasks from the catalog, um, where the diagnostics is written uh, with the help of ontologies. Uh, why? Because one can abstract from various details of turbines to, to, towards ontologies and then write diagnostics on top of ontologies. Um, this was a very nice and very successful thing that that, that was done a few years back and actually um, I was involved in that and we even got a base paper award for that. It was a very nice impact we showed um, in terms of these remote diagnostics. Um, another impact uh, is for Infesto um, that together with Uni Oxford we are developing a semantic solution to help configure um, things like that, where you would like to get a complex this Cartesian system, uh, for example, for form refactoring, like a conveying line or something. Um, to do that, uh, to configure the system, it can be configured out, out of thousands of basic components and millions of, of drive trains. So we're talking about billions of combinations, which is really difficult to do. And uh, a relational or classical database technology um, is good, but it's not as fast. Uh, with semantic solution, uh, and in particular developing a large ontology, um, which is a big ontology with, uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of axioms, the configuration went from hours to minutes. Uh, of those complex systems. In Bosch, uh, we also use ontologies in various ways, for example, for data integration on top of manufacturing data. Um, and the semantic data integration helps to put data together going from hours, days to days, minutes. Um, another example of impact for welding machines, you'd like to predict the quality of these machines so they connect pieces of metal together. And yeah, so this, uh, they, they do these kind of connections. And there, together with, with, with the PhD student I worked on, uh, worked with, we, with in Bosch, so we developed methods to layer ontologies on top of the data from welding machines to help understanding quality of welding operations, um, uh, and, and, and this made a big impact. So here, uh, so in this, in this um, and this is actually our use case in Onta Commons. Um, so here, in order to predict quality of welding operations, one has to go through this pipeline of tasks, task, ne task negotiation, data preparation, feature preprocessing, machine learning modeling, and so on. And there is a number of challenges in communication, data integration, generalizability of machine learning models. And all of that can be improved with ontologies. Um, so we layered ontologies on top of that. 
um, on, on over this pipeline and these anthologies like the core ontology for task negotiation then then some domain ontologies for data integration um, and so on and so they could be extended with some other like packaging ontologies if you go to another production things machine learning ontologies as well and this can help uh, also to to form pipe machine learning uh, pipelines also in the ontological form and store them so all of that on top of the welding data help us to do machine learning based analytics uh, for welding operations and it goes again from day, days to hours uh, this impact so in terms of measuring the impact um, in terms of measuring the impact um, I can say that the yardstick that we could use, and actually maybe the most valid one, uh, is to do calculations in some of these objective measures like, you know, days, hours, going down to minutes. Uh, one can also convert this into money, because always, whenever you save time, you can always calculate how much money you saved on that as well. Um, but money is, it's, I say, less obvious because you know, when you say a million is it a lot or not so it, it depends but when you say that you save time from days to uh, to to hours or hours to minutes is then it's much easier to understand because when you when you say this time saving you can understand that in a large company if you say if you say um, if you go this way down in in, um, in, in time uh, and then you scale it across multiple factories multiple pl multiple players then the impact would be really drastic because it's we're talking about one particular analytic case for example where we save a lot of time and and in terms of thousands of analytical cases then it will be a, a lot um, a lot a lot a, a lot of savings uh, so then Impact is tremendous as soon as we can get it nailed down to very concrete terms, for example, time saving. And then one can convert it into money, and then it depends on each and every organization how to turn time saving into money saving. Anthologies do help to save a lot of time, as you've seen through, through a number of examples. This is what, it, what I'd like to say about the, uh, measuring the impact uh, about, uh, of anthologies in, in, in use cases here. Anna? Hello, hello. I cannot hear you. Hello? Oh, yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh -huh. okay. So this uh, was the presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, very, uh, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from, from the audience? Um, I Basically, again, well, the, you can post it in the question and answer slot. Mm -hmm. um, do, uh, do you think, well, you emphasize quite a lot in the talk uh, that uh, the time is very well perceivable um, uh, criteria for uh, success of uh, ontology deployment or maybe any kind of technology deployment in the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it applies to uh, all uh, demonstrated scenarios uh, on the commons, for example, or maybe in some areas it can be more difficult. Take this as a most important criteria. And I think that the time is, it's, it, it's quite a universal criteria. Uh, how can we say that there is an impact? Um, if we say that um, there was technology A uh, before ontology, now we bring ontology in and now we have technology B. And then, then well, how can we say that ontologies do make an, an, an impact there? Um, that So the tasks that people were trying to solve with all technology versus the, the tasks that we could compare, um, we can see how much they how much they invested in the uh, in, in solving the uh, problems using old technologies and how much um, they they benefit with the new technology time is is, is really universal uh, because in terms of the money if we put um, price tag to each of these use cases that i've just mentioned um, then it will be difficult to understand uh, for example in one case it's one million saving another one in other cases one billion saving one billion is it a lot or not well it seems to be a lot but actually one billion could be a lot but it's just a lot because there are a lot of instances of deployment of a system and in every instance when you use ontologies you save maybe 10 cents but there are so many deployments then you save a lot of money in another case it's just one deployment which saves you million and then basically 
uh, when uh, this this multiplication factor on how many instances of a particular deployment you use, um, that's when either put this as well into account, or it's easier if if you say that um, in, in time in terms of the time it's it, it is it is a much easier way to understand. Um, and then basically, if you say that how much time you saved, uh, for example, on um, on 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 either welding diagnostics or say this turbine diagnostics. So you see how much time you save uh, on diagnosing one particular turbine. From that, um, one can get an estimate how much time you would save if you go from one turbine to thousand to millions of turbines or millions of turbines. So that's um, if you say that you, if you say that you saved hundred euros on diagnostics of one turbine, then it's unclear what what this hundred euros mean. Is it a lot or not? Um, maybe yes, maybe not. And then if you go from one country to another, then one hundred euros can be in one country, twenty dollars can be in another country, thousand rupee can be in another country. And so, but if the time it's it's, it's quite universal, it's free from uh this uh, price of the um, uh, of the that that you have to spend for example the um, the, the, uh, the hourly rates and, and other things are, are kind of uh, in this case they're hidden and what you see is the is is the time which is which is the critical thing and also in onto commons we go from the idea that on the commons help to go from some ontologies into standardized ontologies and this is what we can also show uh, that before ontologies um, the problems were solved in X time. After anthologies came in, there is this you know, half of X or 10% of X or some hours are saved on, on, on this with the semantic technologies. But when you use standardized semantic technologies, then one could show how this make another impact, that you are able to save another few hours in every task because the anthologies are standardized and they become somewhat easier or better to perceive or, or in some other ways. And that, that could also show that the standardization uh, that is delivered through onto commons, for example, how this can help as well. Yeah, but um, if you go from onto commons in general to semantic technologies, then the time is really a universal way of measuring things. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, for me, it's hard to hard to think about other measures which are kind of which you can use to unify the impact across all these applications. Uh, yeah, of course, design, uh, yeah. If, if the process is already established and you're doing the same thing uh, all over again and uh, then you can compare them, but if, for example, you're defining something else which did not exist before, then you cannot compare the time to what was there before because maybe you identified a new process, a new product, and then mm -hmm. it's again add, adds value, but <laughs> it's something that was not done before. <laughs> I was thinking yes. about this scenario, yeah, maybe. Oh, that's a good question. If you're kind of in a greenfield scenario where there is nothing before ontologies, and now you came with your with ontologies and, 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 and tried to solve a problem that was not addressed before, um, then the impact, in this case, the impact will be uh, of a solution. So whether it's ontological or some other solution, and then the eventually kind of impact could be, say, the, um, the effectiveness. So before there was the task was not addressed at all now the task is addressed and solved ontologies help um, but whether ontologies are good or not would be difficult to judge because if you use instead of ontologies say relational database solution um, you may also get a, su a success rate um, so you can succeed with a new task with ontological or relational solutions and to say that the ontologies are the ones who who, who, who give some good benefits it would be hard to say hard to say if even if there is no other old technology to compare with here yeah. so in the greenfield scenario it's actually more difficult to do the judgment i would say yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay do we have more questions uh, then thank you uh, let's then move to the next speaker um mm -hmm. next speaker is uh Icar uh, Espanola from um, Technica, um, and the title of the talk is Characterizing Tribological Experiments, Current Status and Impact of Under Commons on Technica Demonstrator. So we are moving more from manufacturing a bit more into science. <laughs> and Icar, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. So, uh, well, as you said, this uh, demonstrator is more focused on on uh, tribology science. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, well, I'm Iker Esnaola. I come from Technicer. I'm uh, the I'm a researcher and also 
the coordinator of uh, artificial intelligence here. We are a research and development center located in, in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country, and uh, we have more than 40 years of experience on, on applied research. And uh, what we try to do is to improve the, the competitiveness of our clients through the transfer of uh, technology. We are specialized in, in manufacturing because, well, historically the, the manufacturing has had a, a very strong presence in the Basque Country, but we are also experts in, in other domains like the, like the tribology. So what, what is the, the tribology? The, the tribology is the science that uh, studies uh, interacting surfaces in relative motions such as in, in bearings or, or gears. Uh, well, the tribology is, is a key enabling uh, technology for developing new products and also for driving uh, new materials into sustainable solutions. Anyway, uh, well, of course, in order to know how a material, a given material will behave, it's necessary to perform some experiments. Now the the problem here in this domain is that uh, there is there is a lack of standards. I mean, uh, different uh, companies may document their experiments in different ways, using different formats and and different data structures, data models. So um, having this heterogeneous uh, information, it's it's not easy to to access them. And sorry, and that's what we try to uh, do in in this demonstrator in in Onto Commons. We try to help tribologists to find these um, these experiments, um, and of course, this way shorten the time, the number and the size of experiments they need to perform in order to understand the behavior of a, of a given material under certain conditions. Uh, because the problem is that many times uh, tribologists perform experiments that uh, have already been performed, if not the same, very similar, but uh, they cannot access this, this information because as I said, it's, uh, they, they're not using uh, standards. So, uh, in this case, we are using semantic technologies as one of the of the main drivers or, or technologies that will help us achieve this goal. And um, I was I on, I was sorry I also wanted to comment that uh, this demonstrator is connected to the iTribomat project um, and also the the data sources that are available in this project. So, which is which is the the approach that we are uh, envisioning? Well, uh, we propose using a common representation for the tribological experiments. Not only that, also with the use of of ontologies and semantic technologies in general, uh, we think that we could enrich the the existing data, the the, the experiments, with additional uh, knowledge that could also help to uh, well improve the the, res the representation of the of the experiments and for that uh, for helping the the tribologists we propose having an ontology based data access just um, in a similar way to the use cases that the, that Eugenie has just presented so that way we would have a, a layer that somehow abstracts uh, from the underlying heterogeneous data sources, and we would have an, an a homogeneous access to to this data. So here you can see uh, well uh, a schema that could help for uh, well for explaining our approach. So the idea is that the tribologist would uh, work directly with a user interface, and this user interface somehow um, abstracts the, the user from the underlying uh, technological details. So, um, well, also the idea is that the, the data would still be in the original databases, 
I mean, we are not trying to extract that data and, and put it in an RDF store, but instead we want to keep it uh, in the original databases and uh, implement um, somehow federated search service. So this is what we are currently doing in, in our demonstrator. So uh, which are the, the benefits of uh, being part of uh, Honto Commons? Well, uh, first of all, to cooperate with, with partners that are having similar requirements in other demonstrators. Uh, well, this cooperation also helps to at times uh, share the sorrows or you know find some uh, understanding from from other people that are dealing with uh, similar problems um, one of the the other interesting points is that um, we are receiving support from um, experts in a wide vi variety of of uh, domains like in in materials and also uh, ontology engineering and we also get to know uh, related ontologies, uh, domain level ontologies, um, that we would otherwise uh, have difficulties to, to get to know. Uh, so that we finally can uh, make this alignment with these ontologies and, and contribute to, uh, to having this uh, harmonized ontology ecosystem, which is one of the goals of of uh, onto commons and as i said uh, we are currently working on this uh, demonstrator we have already identified the the requirements or, or which is the the information that should be represented in in each tribological experiment uh, we are also in conversation with uh, similar demonstrators of onto commons uh, three other demonstrators and uh well once we coordinate somehow we, we we are able to to join forces we are planning to extend some existing ontologies to cover these new requirements that we have already identified um, for the tribological experiments that we are trying to characterize well this is these are the the current fairness metrics or indicators that we have for our demonstrator. Well, they are very much related with the, um, well, the, the fair principles that uh, have been explained and, and discussed in, in the session uh, during this morning. Um, and well, we, even though right now the, the well, the level, the fairness level is, is rather low we have we do have uh, quite high expectations and we are expecting to improve these these metrics um, well especially because we are relying on ontologies and um, also well as uh, one of the speakers this morning said the fairness uh, kpis are I think it was the 90% of the time are about metadata. And uh, I think, that, I mean, since that's one of the of the main requirements to improve these fairness metrics, I think we can, uh, we can improve them. And once we, we are done with the, with the demonstrator, once we achieve this um, objective that I have just uh, presented, uh, you know, having access to to different, well, to experiments stored in different uh, databases in a homogeneous way, we are expecting to reduce the uh, the times and, of course, also the the resources needed to um, to develop new materials. So in terms of resources we and, and time, both in both uh, aspects, we are expecting to reduce uh, 20%, which is quite a lot uh, in this case. And uh, yeah, that's that's all from from my side. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. Other questions from the audience? Um, okay, maybe. Um, uh, would you agree with the previous speaker about the criteria? Because while well, you also mentioned time is important uh, on this, um, or do, would you also think there are also other criteria which should be explicit when you evaluate the effectiveness of technology use? Or how to, how to convince people that they really should apply this? Well, yes, if I think time is one of the one of the easiest way or, or more, more obvious to to the people, just like uh, yeah, the previous speaker said, if you are able to reduce your, in this case, experiments from months to days or from days to hours, uh, it would be great. Especially here, the thing is that uh, you probably need to perform a set of experiments to get to know the behavior of a, of a given material, uh, because you may need to uh, make a, an experiment, then analyze the results, then uh, try to uh, tune a little bit the, the parameters you are using for the experiment. So it's uh, quite uh, costly in terms of, of time to uh, get to know the, the behavior uh, or, or the tribological behavior of, of a given material. So with this uh, approach, if you are able to uh, at least discover similar um, uh, similar experiments that have already been performed. You will be able to um, fine tune better the or design better in a more accurate way the the experiments you the experiment you are about to perform. So uh, I think that's that's a great uh, help for the tribologists, which nowadays they simply rely on their on their previous uh, knowledge, on their experience, and also on the on the literature, which many times, uh, you know, they they don't use either a, a standardized um, way to document these these experiments. So yeah, I think definitely the the, the reduce in time, it's one of the <laughs> one of the greatest uh, ways to convince them. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, well, the, you also have users involved and they have to interact with the system also using also graphical user interfaces. Do you have uh, challenges uh, with this? Uh, that, of course, well, technology helps, but if people cannot use it <laughs> in a good way or spend a lot of time to get to, to learn it, and this is also kind of... <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that, that that's another challenge. We we haven't already, uh, we haven't still uh, started with the um, uh, with this graphical user interface. But yeah, definitely, the, if this this is the 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 way the users will access and will use the this uh, solution, we need to put a lot of effort on making it uh, intuitive, easy to use, and and appealing also for for the users because otherwise it. I mean, it doesn't matter how how good uh, your solution is if if they, if in the in the end of the day they don't use it, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. So yeah, we should put a lot of effort on that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from the audience. Um... And it says, uh, dear speakers, so it's maybe to all speakers, as you mentioned, time is an easy way to measure impact of using ontologies. Therefore, would you say that ontologies are uh, a tool that would benefit larger companies more than SMEs? Well, uh, not necessarily. I think uh, SMEs could also uh, benefit from this type of uh, solutions. I mean, I guess that time saving is is important for large companies and also uh smaller ones it depends on the on the process that you are dealing with so i think both types uh would benefit from it 
Um, actually, it, it's, it's a good question. Uh, what for whom the time was more valuable for smaller or bigger companies? Um, on the one hand, in bigger companies, clearly, if you save time in one operation and this operation is performed thousands or millions of times across the company, it will be like a huge amount of money uh, if, if you sum across all of these operations. But at the same time, small companies, they um and for, for them um the time is vital maybe for them for them the time is vital to survive because they don't have that much money they have to do things fast in order to kind of survive to get new contracts and move on and big companies they may be able to afford the, the longer time as well so it, it, it depends i guess it may not be so much depending on the size of the company um but on the say on durability of the company in the sense that how long it uh, how, how much how much time how much waiting time of concrete things it can afford uh, for example if you do something then um, concrete uh, say analytics uh, and this analytics and um, th this analytics is that expensive that the small company just will get bankrupt until the analytics will finish then obviously the small company will will be more dependent on this time so i think that yeah, it, it's important for both organizations and this is case by case one need to understand for we for whom um, the time is more valuable for the smaller or the bigger companies yeah. and and of course the time one can also then convert into uh, then uh, towards this uh, co2 neutrality trend that is like really big one nowadays and the more time you save the more CO neutral you are because you spend less resources on, on computing resources, less electricity, um, then you may produce less waste uh, during this uh, the, the time that something is happening. So if you can do faster uh, diagnostics in manufacturing, then uh, you can prevent errors uh, faster if you do predictive diagnostics. So all of that things also um, not can, but I guess should be converted into this particular company specific other dimensions which are beyond the time. Uh, when you say that you save time on something, then, then on some particular operation, then you one can also enumerate the impacts of this save time. You save time on, 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 on predicting um, low quality operations, one could then convert it in how much resources have been saved uh, because this operation has not be, been performed. You predicted in this operation in advance. So that's um, the time, like at the baseline, but this can naturally be converted to 5, 10, 20, uh, like resource saving, uh, CO2 uh, reduction, and other, and other parameters can be unfolded uh, for a particular concrete company. So that's, I would say the time is like you know, something that can be opened up and then dozens of other criteria and parameters could be highlighted for each particular use case. Yeah. But at the higher level, time is a, is a good measurement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any more questions from the audience, so I would suggest to move to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is, would be uh, Jasper Kohorst from Wageningen University of and Research, and the topic would be on demonstrating the FAIR data station for managing metadata in the life sciences. So we move even more towards science. Jasper, I think you are Yeah, there. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> so thank you for the introduction. So I will we'll be talking about the FAIR data station um, because in the life sciences, there will be, there's a lot of data being generated and I am part of an um, infrastructure of the uh, of the unlock system where we work with microbial systems. So these microorganisms that do all kinds of interesting things for the for the for nature, for your human gut, for health, and for the environment. So during this research, it can either be an ac academic level, or but also at industrial level, uh, there is a lot of samples being collected, or research being performed, experiments being done. Um, and often what is always lacking is the metadata that belongs to the information that's being generated. So it is actually crucial that during a research project, we, we, we follow them along um, when you take your samples, when you try to answer scientific question, or when you try to optimize a bioreactor for the industry, um, we need to capture the metadata management. So we have this four step process where when you think about your project, when you think about your experiment, 
uh, there will be this uh, form generation procedure that the scientist along the, the time it, when it's doing the experiments can continuously update this information. So when it takes a, a particular sample from the sea or from a forest or from an internal bioreactor, that this information is captured, but it can also be continuously updated. So that, for example, the temperature or the pH, the time point or at what depth or what longitude and latitude information uh, these samples are taken. Then it is it's, it's nature to humans that people make mistakes. They make typos. They, they, they don't write things down properly. So we have a continuous validation system in place that keeps track of whatever has been changed. Is that according to the standards that we have agreed upon? So once this validation is passed, we, there will be a semantic resource based on different ontologies that then can be used for um, internal research or in, to answer internal questions. OK, which samples belong to which uh, reactor, to which location? But you can also then go abroad over different projects to ask within our SME or within our company what projects are being performed in what area? What samples do we have in place? So we have a um, metadata structure in place where at the moment the highest level is your project, what, yeah, your funding information, what is your research question in general. And then we go into more depth so to get to get more precision on what is being researched. So then we have this investigation. Uh, there we also um, set up the metadata, who is allowed to have access to this kind of information so that systems that then use this metadata can then easily add users or remove users from certain investigations. Within an investigation, we have a study where you actually do the, where the observations are performed in to answer a certain biological question. We have the observation units, which are objects such as bioreactors or uh, fields or oceans or patients that are being sampled or being studied. And we use this according to the Mayapi ontology, which is actually a plant-based ontology. But this information can also be easily mapped to other systems. But of these bioreactors, of these patients, you take your samples. So that can be one, but it can also be thousands of samples over time, where we actually register the metadata in this, at this point at, according to the Genomic Standards Consortium. So this is, these are the official standards for genetic information. Uh, but we are also working on mapping this to social sciences or economics to make this more generic on the information that's being obtained. Then of these samples, there will be data generated so that we know, OK, this data set belongs to this, this sample, to this bioreactor or patients, to this study. So you can actually go into very detailed, this file that I have stored here, where is it associated with? So you can gather all this information. So we have uh, created a web website uh, for that. So it's basically just a Java web app that people can generate these templates, but also can validate continuously uh, what they have registered um, to ensure that the quality is up, yeah, up to the current standards. So we have a general about information page. Then you have the metadata template where you can actually start registering your information about the project information. So what is the project about? What is the title? Do you have a long description about this project that might spawn four or five years uh, in running? Then within this project, you have your investigation or multiple investigations that are being performed. And each of these investigations have their own identifiers, the descriptions, the title, but also user credentials of who is allowed to have access to this particular study. So then we, yeah, you go to the next level so you can fill in your study information. So what is this study going to be about? And then we start diving into the more detailed where you you cannot register things anymore, but then we start selecting metadata. What is important, for example, for the observation units? So we have we have a standard core package, uh, but we can, we can you can easily make uh, new packages. For example, if you are as a research company or a company focusing on human or human health, you can make your own metadata package on observation units related to human metadata. So then you can specify there um, what is very important to have registered about this observational unit. Then we have uh, at sample level, so you take your samples from these uh, observational units and there we already start uh, incorporating these current standards from the Genomics Consortium where they have a large variety 
of metadata. So you, you can take samples from the air, from food, um, from uh, farm environments, from the human skin, also from the soil or sediments. And based on this criteria, depending on the package that will be used, metadata will change. So here we have the core metadata. We have decided this is obligatory for each sample that's being registered. Is it safe to use? What is the identifier? Where can I find it? What is the condition stored up in? But of course, you can also have air specific metadata. So for example, what is the altitude? What is the elevation of the location where this sample was taken? So you might, because you might need this additional information when you start um, collecting and working with your metadata. Then we also adhere to syntax standards. Um, and that is also being used by the validator to ensure what you've written down as an example, that that is yeah, according to the syntax that is being registered. So that you always know yeah, what the metadata means. So it is more detailed. And of course, in the description, we will explain in more detail what we mean with this example and with this syntax with this field. So we also have then the data sets. So currently this is with a focus on the life science on and genetics. And there again, you can, you can select different kind of data sets that can be generated in your project and they can be automatically expanded with additional metadata fields that yeah, depending on the, the kind of research fields people are working in, what kind of metadata should be captured for the data set. So for example, here for Amplicon data, we have a whole list of um, information, uh, the general descriptions, identifiers, names, but also the date when this data set was generated, uh, but also, for example, where was this data generated? But which we, 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 gen we generate these data sets often by external companies. So you would also like to register which company generated this data for us? What equipment did they use? Uh, because it might actually be that one company might be generate better results than another company. So that's also a way of comparing these things with each other. So then once you have selected whatever is important, what is needed, you already filled in your project information, your investigation. So then you say, generate my um, yeah, form to fill in. And I actually it just generates an Excel file. And why Excel? It's because it's still the most, yes, the easiest software package that is out there where you can easily register thousands and thousands and thousands of samples. We already have multiple projects that are using this, but we have more than 2000 samples. So then you, yeah, you need to have an environment where people are familiar with, but they can also easily register an entire uh, range of information. So for example, if you have for an entire set of samples that are taken from the same location with different time points, you can very quickly fill in where this, inf where this sample was taken from. So this really speeds up the process of gathering this metadata about these samples. And then of course, when, when a person has, okay, let's say after a few months, it collected uh, the first batch of samples, it can then fill in this form, it can start to generate data, but in the meantime, we can already start validating what has been registered so far. Is that up to the current standard we, are, we have agreed upon? So for example, here, there's this sample in the first row, it just did not fill in the sample name. And according to the standard that is currently there, the sample name is an obligatory field, so the researcher needs to go back to his to his Excel file and fill this in this information. But of course, this can also be if you fill in the altitude and you only fill in the number, but not the unit, it will also complain that it does not fit the syntax that we expect. So then the, 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 the data registrator can go back and forth until the validator accepts it. And then it will generate a semantic web or an RDF data file. And that is the default output that then can be used in downstream processes, where you can actually load these data sets into your triple stores and do your querying. So this entire, met, all these metadata fields are, are back, yeah, this, in the back end we have these field requirements. Um, so that, that's basically what the web interface uses to adjust its metadata. So we have a general package label. So we know, is it an air sample, an air sample, a soil sample, a water sample? Then we have a comment name, that's, um, that's the, for the structure. We have uh, this for the, in the RDF. Then we have the item description, which is basically the RDFS label that is more the human readable format. Is it obligatory or not? What is the syntax? So the, the, yeah, you can see there's a regular expression that is required. An example, so 
to give it to the user what we mean exactly, what we prefer as a unit. So for example, if you talk about altitude, we prefer meters, but maybe this is a very low level system. So people might use centimeters or if it's very high, you can of course think of kilometers, but we have a preferred unit. Then of course, we can already work on predicate levels. So where, what if this kind of predicate should be used for this kind of metadata field and then the definition uh, that's being used to describe what we mean. So that's basically another big table where we have here on the left, we have the package name, the structure common name, the, the RDFS label, the requirements, X is optional, M is mandatory, um, the syntax. So there we can really describe in detail what are the restrictions. And then you have the examples. And in, for example, the URL, we have the mix prefix for a certain standard. Then this entire web interface is backed by Ampusa, which is an ontology validator and code generator. So we made a skeleton ontology uh, based on some standards. And that generates our Java API where we can program directly against, and it will do the basics of validations uh, initially. And then on top of that, we also have the syntax validator in place to go into more detail. So this really speeds up the development process of your interface because you can directly communicate with the application programming interface. And this is then, for example, a yeah, raw dump of a sample where we have some information. We have the biosafety level is an integer. We have strings. We can have dates in there. It all depends on the syntax what is used. And then a sample can have one or many data set, uh, yeah, essays yeah, that contains additional data um, to link everything together, which makes it much easier to query uh, this information. Of course, this is continuously being improved. We are continuously working on the development uh, to also enable this outside of our unlock infrastructure. So we have an unlock version really focused on the life sciences, all these microbial communities. We are currently working on a more generalized version uh, on, under the Fair by Design uh, banner, where we also try to capture all the disciplines. But we are, our expertise is in the life science. So if there are other disciplines that would like to use this, then we can collaborate to make certain packages for these fields. But the source is, at a, is, a, is a good repository. Every, all the code is open so everybody can have a look at it. And our code generator that we use for the API is, uh, is from Ampusa, which you can find there. And with that, that's the uh, end of my presentation. So if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much. Other questions? Um, here is uh, what's, well, I think this is, for, of course, uh, um, more uh, towards uh, research, the talk and research data management. And uh, what I was wondering, because we, we make our data fair uh, to, in order to be findable and reusable and well for research but also for industry and uh, in this case well do you have a solution on how to um, help people to annotate data in a way that it's findable by other use cases and one should also take into account because for example you make some experiment but you don't know which uh, kind of observations can be important for um, another researcher right maybe for example you measure something uh, how the river flows, uh, but you don't measure the level of sun and, you know, this kind of, and maybe for other, other, other researcher, this is important. And uh, how would you help both researchers to find what they can annotate their data without uh, also spending too much on this? Um, or um, um, Yeah, there's a, there's a very small tipping point on when, yeah, you try to keep it as minimum as possible. Mm -hmm that people can easily register the information. But that's why we also work with these um, packages so that you can look um, as, for example, if you take the air package, there are, there are maybe 100 different fields that can be of importance. Only a few are really required, but it, it gives people an idea, especially that it's important that you do this kind of information gathering before you actually start your project uh, or that you start before you start collecting samples that you can see uh, these are topics that often are captured by people. And do I find that important or not? And based on those criteria, you can then, yeah, you might realize uh, earlier on, that, oh, I should measure also the temperature. That's actually very easy to do. So why not take it with me? But if you did not see this form, you might have forgotten about it. 
So we have studies where they did it in wetlands, where we had these yeah, little nature ponds, but they just didn't capture the temperature because it, it just didn't occur, occur to them to capture this information. <laughs> you so you need to have these templates in place to guide them, to steer them. But of course, when you are at a company, you can also sit with a group of people and create your own package saying, OK, we have all these packages that are used in the public, but maybe we think it should be differently. We can take certain elements for package A, certain elements for package B, and create our own SME package for whatever, for whatever field, and then say these are really obligatory. So internally, you can have different requirements than um, yeah, what is in the scientific field available. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine you also can uh, generate these forms or suggest some ontologies to use to annotate based on, on the data which is already in the system? Like or which what people write papers about, for example, if you see that people write a lot about my well, people write about microbes, they, for example, refer to temperature quite often. And you can already suggest uh, for somebody who is doing this, maybe you want to record also this, this value. Yeah, so what we're currently also working on is basically mining the entire metadata that's currently being registered. So we have these big, yeah, repositories where genetic information is stored and people manually attached metadata to it. It's it's very unstandardized, but we actually try to collect all this information to see what is commonly used in the fields. And based on that, we can then learn what should be applied in your data sets as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a question from Amaya. So how do you finance the maintenance of the website and what is your business model? So Unlock is a um, governmentally funded research project and will be funded for 10 years. So um, we are now in year one. So we still have at least nine years of funding left that we will definitely stay alive and it will be stay in development. In addition, everything is open source and we actually try now to connect with the yeah, scientific community or with, with, or with companies and with researchers um, to see can we bring this to a higher level so that it's not an only an unlock solution, but that is more broadly applied into the field so that more people are going to use it. And then hopefully based on that, we will have a longer yeah, period to stay alive. But also in our department, where we do a research, we already see the impact of this internally. So internally, we will keep supporting this because we need it to collect the metadata. When we start writing scientific articles or when you want to share your information with other people, you need to have a way of capturing, the, capturing this information. So this will probably stay there uh, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. All right, so then um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, then we move to the next part of the, the remaining part of this session, which we basically will have a, dis a discussion more in free form, well, in semi-free form, because <laughs> I already have some um, starting points for this. and. Um, Right, so we stopped at the um, agenda and um, well, basically this session is a part of um, demonstrators work package. So in Onto Commons, we have different work packages dealing with, uh, well, or some of them deal more with technologies and this particular one, which we lead, deals more with demonstrators about helping them to, um, to use to adopt ontology um, technologies um, and also to understand what uh, where are the road uh, blocks for this and uh, also to create uh, towards creation of a roadmap um, on what we should be doing and for this we already have some demonstrators well two of them you have seen uh, from Bosch and um, from um, Technica but we have uh, already a few of um, few more that work with us on on this um, topics and um, and also we, we are extending now the consortium towards more demonstrators. Uh, so generally, well, we start with this 11 and then we um, try to identify basically while well, we do specifications for them and see how they develop also over three years of time uh, in the project and uh, what they succeed uh, to use and uh, or not to use, uh, and also, of course, uh, they are also interacting with the packages that work on, particularly on tools and on um, ontologies in the, on the commons, and um, we try to find ways to 
basically raise technology level uh, readiness levels and uh, raise fair uh, levels and then we re um, record everything and uh, see what basically goes on and what runs well and what runs not so well in order to have the best practices. So there was also a call for demonstrators. So uh, maybe some of you who are here also applied and uh, to join as a new demonstrators to basically help us to create this common um, vision and common uh, picture to make um, ontology technologies more mature. Uh, so we are closing this call now. And well, if there is some interest to join actually us um, in producing this roadmap, uh, you can still apply. We would still um, try to integrate you. Um, of course, the links are found on the on the Commons website. Uh, but right now, I would uh, just uh, maybe first ask uh, if the audience has actually uh, any kind of uh, general questions to all speakers about. Well, we have heard three talks, and uh, if some maybe general enough question which was not answered, uh, we can ask. Uh, you can ask on some of uh, the things. Um, because when no, I would um, go and discuss um, the things which are interesting uh, from this work package point of view, particularly while we talk um, this um, in terms of technology readiness levels, we have uh, making um, ontology adoption and we have um, also the question, well, basically what works well and what works well not so well. And uh, especially in the under commons projects, uh, we have uh, people also work packages working on uh, with top level ontologies, um, with mid level ontologies, with domain ontologies, and uh, with the various semantic um, tools um, deployment. And uh, so this is the um, maybe um, well, a starting point, or at least at this point of time, would be very interesting to know. And especially, we want to have interaction between different work packages working well that uh, demonstrators really get help uh, from others um, on uh, specific topics. And we already, from the first, because we already did the first round of interviews with demonstrators, and we had some topics. Well, for example, many people, many demonstrators were mentioning um, they would want to do, for example, um, collaborative ontology development, but tools for this were not very often were not very advanced and um, some further feedback like this we were getting. Um, but I think, well, we have more um, also people on this session, so audience also can actually comment and, uh, well, I don't know, maybe we can even turn on some um, uh, also people from audience to speak. Um, so, um, and uh, also, for example, with top level ontologies, we were often observing that people kind of, uh, people often don't use them and um, hard to explain why, maybe they don't see immediate benefits and, uh, but then how to change the situation is also interesting. Um, something interesting to think about. Um, Maybe we can start with the existing with the speakers from from this session. If you have, uh, well, how, how would you classify your major challenges with using um, adoption of ontologies and uh, adoption of ontology tools, or where would you need like help immediately in the near future? Yeah, so what we actually see from our end is, is on the technical side, it's it's okay to in, yeah, incorporate existing ontologies and uh, to use them to a certain extent. There's still, of course, always elements missing because then, yeah, not one ontology is perfect. But actually, the most complex part is from the user side that they actually have to start using it. So how do you force people to start using your infrastructure to use those ontologies to Register, for example, in our case, have it is metadata. How do we force them to register this information properly? So we can make the most amazing software and make the most amazing user interfaces, but then it's still at the personal level that they have to start feeling this information and actually using these systems um, where the most difficulty part is. Because it's also it's, it's a different environment that people are used to it. 
um, because yeah, everybody is familiar with Excel or with Word for these standard applications, but then you suddenly start to yeah, jump further, um, yeah, you, you create a boundary and that will make yeah, makes things a lot more difficult because not everybody experienced with these technologies. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's more like a technical challenge or uh, maybe ICA has a different <laughs> perspective <laughs> with a more manufacturing use case? <laughs> No, I, I would say that I also agree with, with Jasper, but, you know, maybe when you tell people that you are going to use ontologies, at first they panic a little bit like, hey, I don't want to use this. So maybe it could be as simple as if you hide what's, what's behind, what you are using underlying your system. So that's why I was saying that we are planning to use a, an interface. Maybe uh, users don't need to know what's what's going on behind uh you know behind the scenes uh as long as it works i guess that uh they will be happy and maybe it's not necessary to um you know to say the word ontology that they fear so much at times mm -hmm. do you think it's also a bit of a different because if you take pure research probably we make want to make people use everything voluntary because they need it for their work. Well, in the manufacturing scenario, you can say, well, they are employees and they have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have some challenge also, which is maybe non-technical, right? In some way, in, when it's not a production scenario. Yeah, for example, for, for, for the part of uh, making data fair, I think that there is that challenge on, I mean, why should they make the effort to produce the the metadata, right? If, if they don't see a, a, a direct benefit in their, in their work, um, it can be difficult for them or, or for us to convince them to make it, especially if, if, if it's not in a, in a, like, like, like you said, in a manufacturing process or, or uh, work where they are forced to do it. So yeah, I, I see there is a, a challenge there. And uh, I don't, I, I don't know how, how to, how to address it the, the, in a convincing way. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's also the case? Well, sometimes it's, uh, yes, uh, maybe with low level uh, worker at a production you can say okay you you will use this tool and uh, but with uh, say upper management uh, well for example to explain them that they use need to use top level ontology because it's good for information integration in five to ten years from now maybe they won't be that convinced huh? <laughs> yeah you won't be able to convince uh, them no. on that level for sure no but then but then indeed what Irka said is that you have to hide you have to hide this kind of technology behind the scenes. So it will be adopted without people realizing it. And that's basically also in a way that we how we use it with this Excel document. So we hide the technology behind it. So that only if you really want to go there on a technical level, you want to compare across studies or across projects, there is a possibility to use this technology to mine this information. But if you are just a scientist on your own or researcher you work on, on a small topic and you don't really care you can still fill it in but for you it's just an excel file and then you can hide it a bit on uh, for, for the rest uh -huh. hmm. if i understood the question correctly i, I got disconnected for, for for a few minutes um then the question was uh, on the top level ontologists and and uh, how to um, how to convince uh, the um, the people that it's uh, the good it's a good thing it's a useful thing right this was the question yeah yeah it's something like uh, what mm -hmm. when when you don't see immediate benefits but you know in principle it's good to use them because maybe your data integration will become simpler in the project but maybe there is no immediate benefit and how mm -hmm. do you experience with this uh yeah, um, actually, yeah, showing the ontologies or explaining ontology said the technology may not be the most productive way because I don't think they might be interested. They are interested in, in, in the technology details. Um, 
to give an example um, how one can convince that something is good um, is um, there is a Catena X uh, project which is built on top of Gaia X, this European Data Spaces Initiative. Um, and in Catena X, um, the idea is to allow uh, data sharing across the whole uh, automotive value chain. So when th this is th th this is what 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 they want is to improve uh, the automotive value chain and to make it circular, to make it sustainable, to make all of these things work in a good way. And obviously, automotive value chain involves many producers, suppliers. It's 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 a long value chain um, from from resources um, to coming to cars to tracing things and then to recycling and so on. So there, in order to share data across, one needs standardized ways to enable this data sharing across and. And whether these are ontologies or, or whatever else, that might not be that interesting for, for, for the management, but the fact that there is a technology, ontology uh, based technology that enables data sharing across the value chain, that, that may, this is something that attracts attention. Um, and, and definitely standardization of, of these artifacts uh, across the whole value chain, this is very important because obviously one would not like to have this value chain interconnected through um, uh, th through artifacts where everyone creates these artifacts in whatever crazy way they think, or maybe not crazy way, I mean, some other way they think, but um, it's ideal to have everything uh, standardized across, connected to ISO standards, connected to good practices, and, and to be as standardized as it could, as it could get. Um, and um, and that's um, and uh, then whether these ontologies, top level, middle level, domain ontologies, or, or things like that, this this would be secondary. Uh, the fact that ontologies as a technology allows to do data standardization, um, that, that's a good, that's a big thing. Um, one thing that I've heard um, also from people um, looking at this standardization across some domains, value chains, um, is that um, there is also a necessity to address legal aspects. Uh, for example, if you'd like to share data, an ontology is the mechanism to share data, it would be a mechanism to share data. How could you ensure the legal um, the legal aspects surrounding the data, sharing the data, usage of the data? Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that ontologies do have these legal aspects in, embedded, but if they do, that would be also great. If one could say that ontologies not only at the technical level allow data sharing, but they also allow you to negotiate about data, uh, to to set the boundaries of the data usage, to do all of the things uh, that are necessary to be done in order for companies not uh, to, to not to be afraid of sharing data. Uh, that's that's another thing. Yeah, so that's that I think that's convincing not at the top level whatever level ontologies, but on the on the benefits. And uh, telling that standardization comes, and then um, yeah, mm -hmm. also the legal aspects could be important. Because still, yes, it uh, should be a convincing scenario. Yes, of course, legal aspects. Yeah, they are the driver of many projects, especially when, for example, GDPR. Yeah. <laughs> then people start to think how to do to work with it, and there are still solutions not there, and there is mm -hmm. a chance basically to adopt them these technologies using such scenarios yeah but probably we need a kind of a clear scenario example of descriptions also at the end that um, for some specific sectors we have um, clear stories which people could follow at the end of the project mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, another thing that actually has a lot of success is the concept of digital twins, um, which has attracted really a lot of attention and many people are convinced about digital twins. And uh, this comes with this understanding this digitalization is, is, is inevitable. You do dig digitalize uh, a lot of things in manufacturing, um, think, talking from the manufacturing point of view. Um, and then in making digital twins of physical processes, machines and, and other things, via some uniform standard is, is what is um, what is attractive. Ontologies, they can play this role of um, digital twins. Here again, when you talk about digital twins, one important question uh, that will eventually come is how do you do simulation? Because this is one of the things that people would love to do with digital twins is when you have um, digital representation of a factory, uh, you would like to simulate to see how something behaves. Like if you plug a new robot 
into the place of an old one inside the factory, what would happen? Um, and that's this simulation thing can actually talking about materials. Uh, also, as one of the speakers mentioned about some materials, um, so the simulation of material, if you have some digital twins, where material also play a role, some ontology of some processes with materials, then one would like to simulate it to understand um, some piece of plastic, how long it can survive in various um, like bending or some uh, other uh, aggressive situations. Um, this so various type of simulations that come with, with digital twins. So uh, in this case, usage ontology, using ontologies for for some benefits like uh, this digitalization and, and digital twins or data integration and sharing can cross. Uh, this will eventually come with aspects which we may not that often discuss in the ontology community or, or never discuss, like the legal aspects um, or the simulation aspects and, and, and how can one click a magic button on top of ontology and say, simulate for me something. Like simulate, like create some knowledge graph that can form ontology and that can show me the behavior of a system in the next three years. And, and, and check that on during these three years simulated data, there will never be some bad thing happening. Like um, there is no downtimes or um, something doesn't degree too much or things like that. So that's that's another thing. So um, that's, yeah. So that um, the digital twin, I think it's, um, yeah, to kind of cut the long story short, digital twin is, I think it's also an, an important aspect to sell ontologies, not to call them ontologies in some cases, but to to, to, to use the term digital twin uh, might be also more appealing and more convincing here. Yeah, this is also a kind of scenario one can use. Uh, in Wagen, we also do, use this term uh, for living organisms because, for example, you can also model some nutrition aspect, for example, and then see what happens with a human if you feed him or her with potatoes the whole time and things like this. <laughs> so we have <laughs> projects like this as well, not not on, well with life sciences and <laughs> nutrition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, similar to <laughs> not only yes. for manufacturing. We also have it on a more yeah, industrial level, it's on, an, uh, on a farm level. So Wagen University is a uh, agricultural university. We actually have a digital twin is currently in development of a farm where we keep track of everything, what is happening inside that farm, what is happening on the fields, what's happening with the tractor. So everything is interconnected there. So we have always have a digital representation of when should you do the what, when, based on the input of sensors and information. So there also the digital twinning is a very high, a very important aspect in current research. Mm -hmm. And do you do it with semantic technologies? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. And do you do with, with ontologies, your digital twins? Um, we are trying to, well, it's, a, it's a definitely a separate research group. So we are we are pushing them towards uh, a semantic technology, especially for the metadata and information from sensors. But it's a very, it's a slow progress because still uh, the technology is not that widely known everywhere. So mm -hmm. the adoption rate is still on, an, uh, on a very relatively slow pace. So it's getting there, but not as, as fast as we would like. I think it's mm -hmm. also about capacity building that people have to have skills in this area and of course we need to teach some students mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> before this um, happens <laughs> the more the better we are working on that <laughs> yeah we are working on this yeah actually teaching students is a big thing because if you look at, at the teaching curriculum in, in universities who teach things about data then typically the the teaching or well, the relational databases are taught uh, widely database administrators uh, you can find them in essentially every university people who graduate with computer science so they they do have some database um, background but there's no sql data some semantic rdf that's um, not the most popular uh, uh, think in, in the teaching material that's, that's also yeah that, that's completely true so i'm currently actually a course coordinator for linked data here at Wagner university and that's only for the last two years before that it didn't exist at all so there was there were some people doing things in semantic web or with linked data with ontology so but mostly on a higher level research uh, department but it was not done at the educational level so that is now coming but it's 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 a slow progress and that really needs a more attention Mm -hmm. um, I think another int interesting aspect that can help in convincing uh, to look closer at these semantics, digital twins, these kind of aspects is 
is the shift which is happening at the database end. If you look at, at the trends in the database technology, if you look at VLDB or some Sigma, some top databases where the main research is happening, there is a lot of trend to go from the classical data into the graph data. So the graph data, um, there is there is a lot of statistics showing how much attention it, it, it gets from both academics and also technology providers. Um, and then the graph data, that's this is the one that is very naturally connectable to the concept of ontologies, digital twins, because then it comes to these um, uh, knowledge graphs um, that can store production data, that can store some uh, some some data that is generated during the run of um, of some systems, and ontologies can describe digital twins on top of these uh, on top of the systems. So that's that also at least this is one of the arguments that um, that I also have in in my portfolio of arguments uh, that the database databases go into the graph direction uh, very 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 fast very rapidly yeah. mm -hmm. Evgeny, there is a question for you um, oh, yeah, sorry do you see it um, could uh, on the expansion of digital twin topic mm -hmm. maybe it's not clear for everybody <laughs> yes <laughs> what's the connection and uh, what uh -huh. is the relation between yeah. those two Okay, okay, I, I can see on the screen, right? Uh, digital twins versus ontologies. Um, so, digital twin, uh, clearly, digital twin is a concept. Um, it's a um, it, it can be quite weak, and uh, and and there are many people, and, and many people have their own reading of this term, like the term big data. What exactly big, the big data is, and then depends on whom you ask, you get you get an answer. Um, so, the digital twin. One way of looking at the digital twin is um, this computer representable and, and storable and processable model of, 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 of a system, for example, of, of, of a manufacturing robot. Um, and aspect models for, uh, are currently a very popular way of, of looking at, at, at digital twins, where you represent um, your machine, your robot, with various aspects of properties, and then you combine those properties in special kind of buckets, which is like these aspect collectors. Um, and th this is, I would say, in, if you look at the at ABB and, and, and Bosch and Siemens and many, and in many big companies, aspect models are synonyms for, 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 um, for the technology behind digital twins. So digital twins, from the semantic also point of view, um, representations in terms of classes and properties of, um, of, of, for example, manufacturing equipment. So the connection is that a digital twin as the concept can be implemented, can be realized with the help of, of ontologies or semantic technologies and um, ontology, knowledge graphs, some kind of shackle constraints, various forms of these semantic artifacts combined together uh, can represent a physical, a physical thing, and they can be the digital twin of this physical thing. Um, I don't know whether it helps or makes it more confusing, this connection between digital twins. So digital twin is a notion of some you know, digital representation of physical aspect, and ontology is, is one way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's also well helpful yeah. because it's also explicit, so it's understood by both humans and machines, and humans can and basically, exactly. you can also build some rule-based systems on top of this model if they, you do digital twins with semantics. Mm -hmm. So yes. um, it's a good and, technology to use it. Yeah, and I would actually look further than just ontologies. I would say semantic artifacts because ontologies, they come with open-world semantics. And in many cases, this is not sufficient for the, um, for, for the scenarios where you would need also to do data validation. Uh, for example, um, constraints, the, like for Shackle is the W3C standard for, for constraints, they are also quite important. You would like to ensure that there is um, a robot with particular configurations, and then whenever you see data about the robot, the data should contain all the information um, that, 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 that is obligatory. Ontologies cannot enforce that into up to the degree which is required. So I would say this um, ontologies plus constraints plus knowledge graphs. So essentially, um, semantic artifacts, um, they combined, they could give this digital twin. Um, they can help to make a digital twin. The notion of simulation is a bit tricky, which is typically expected to come together with digital twin. Um, and how to connect simulation to ontology, that's not a very trivial thing to do, but yeah. 
at least a lot of things can be done with ontologies, constraints, and, and, and graphs here. Yeah, and often I, I saw it's also often used in combination, for example, with machine learning and knowledge graphs with machine learning, for example, because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's ontology is not always, not, not necessarily fully enough to do it. It's still a very complex thing, yes. digital thing. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I have one more question about um, how do I get the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> the question out of the box. I hope it was answered. <laughs> the, um, then the, maybe the very last point of discussion is, um, well, it's uh, somehow related to the previous point, but uh, well, we had also a discussion on fair data session in uh, earlier on. And uh, what do you think, um, again, how to motivate people to make their data more fair? Is it in the same way on how to adopt technologies, just try to, for example, hide it and try to do tools which do as fair data as possible and when do you think the data is um well you think you are enough fair with the fairness and uh, what what is your perspective and what are the main roadblocks yeah of course we already saw discussed some for example if people are not motivated to do it they don't get any technology to do it uh, but maybe there are some more <laughs> Yeah, what I encounter a lot with, with, with people talk about FAIR is that they state you have to do it for other people so they can reuse your data, they can work on your information that you've acquired. And that really is a roadblock already for the, for the person to, yeah, I'm not going to do it for someone else. So we really need to find ways of, okay, how does it benefit you? So if, when you start recording, for example, in, this, in my case, was with this metadata, when you actually start doing your research, it benefits the scientist or the person itself directly because they have recorded everything nicely, everything is well documented, they can really immediately start using it and they don't have to go back to their computer or their hard drive, the USB stick, to where was this information, where was this file. So in that sense, it benefits them directly and indirectly, other people might benefit from it as well. So then you have a different goal in mind to try to first help the person itself or the, the goal, yeah, what the topic is currently working on. And indirectly, it, it makes it more open, more reusable for other, re for other people, or for other companies, for other researchers uh, to use it. And I think that's a mindset that needs to change that if you only say you do it for someone else, then people will throw up yeah, and say, no, I'm not gonna, well, I'm not gonna waste my time on for someone else. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with that. I think that uh, it's, sad to say it but yeah <laughs> i think that many times unless we see a direct benefit for ourselves or our company or whatever we are not going to uh, adopt this kind of of technologies and also just like uh, anna said uh, i think uh, we should provide people with tools or with services where they i mean with their minimum uh, effort they get to have like um, the most fair uh, or, or as fair as possible their to get their data i mean uh, you cannot expect them to uh, dedicate a lot of time to have very complete uh, meta metadata sets for each data set that they are using so uh, it should somehow be automatic or um, with with very little human intervention and uh also that works for a lot of different uh let's say data formats so for example it, it, you you can tell them that it will only work with certain data because otherwise you are um, giving them some constraints that and giving them some more uh options to refuse to use it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can uh, end up with a recommendation for some tools? Well, for example, Jasper was showing one uh, which probably works for some for number of species where, for example, you need to collect observations and document them. But do you think we can come up with a set of tools we can recommend, for example, for demonstrators with similar problems or with similar challenges? <laughs> 
or for example what are what are you using or planning to use in your we well we we are uh developing the, uh, a tool that uh somehow eases the the process of of getting this metadata of course we didn't know the work that uh, jasper was doing so probably <laughs> knowing that will will help us a little bit more uh we were very focused on on uh fairness metrics but related with the quality of the of the data and we were thinking on just the three aspects that i said uh, with um, a tool that has the the minimum human intervention uh, as possible as being as automatic as possible and also which works with a variety of um, data formats and i think that uh, well these three principles are the base for any tool of course that there may be many more things that should be taken into account uh, but in the end of the day we have to since it is something that the users may not see um, directly beneficial for for them unless the the case that Jasper has just commented we have to provide them with some tools some services that are easy to use and uh, that they they are uh, the the requirement that the effort that they have to put uh, into using them it's the minimum mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Jasper, please go ahead here yeah. yeah i think what you said basically what it boils down to is user user friendliness is key it needs to be low levels uh, straightforward to be used and the first level will be that in the back end everything is hidden so that this translation from a normal interface to a ontology or semantic uh, layer behind it and then there should be always an option for the more advanced ways that you can still approach this layer behind it um, so you need to really separate uh, these two entities yeah so probably there are tools for different user groups right should be or maybe the same tool with different access fun options um it spoke comment maybe not on the tools but on the on how to make sure that the data uh, the ontologies they come with there um that, that they do uh, follow the, the fair, fair fair principles and um, one so give a couple of examples um you, you know the really scheme of the talk uh, it's an ontology that one can use to annotate web pages um, and uh, if you annotate your web pages in the right way using the right um, annotations from schema.org then uh, google and some other big search engines they can take your web pages and uh, then your search the search of your web pages will be improved um, how to enforce uh, web pages to be annotated well if you're google you just say that i will not find your page in a nice way that's it that's you can annotate it whatever way you want yeah. so, yeah. so, so, beneficial to use it. Wait. <laughs> So um, th th that's the thing. So if you would like someone to, to, to do something, then uh, in this case, the higher power, like Google, just tell you, you're going to take whatever you want, the way you want, but you know, if you want to benefit from my search, then please do it the way I tell you. Um, if, if, for example, we have some, if there is like an international standard or whatever that requires data to be of particular kind or ontologies to be of particular kind, otherwise they will be rejected, then that makes um, that, that, that may make a difference. At the moment, there is no say, strong ecosystem for, or, or there is no strong big player like Google that just tell everyone, you do it or, or, or I, will, I will ignore you. Um, and uh, for example, in the DOM for Zero project that goes back to back with Onto Commons, where the goal is to develop a um, data marketplace, and, and uh, Bosch and myself, we are, we are members of this, uh, we are also partners in this consortium, DOM, DOM for Zero, their data has to be shared. Um, and, and naturally, if, if in such Frozen, no? Okay, lost connection, yeah. Okay, um, 
we actually need to write wrap up um, in any case, but I think the um, there are of course similarities with fairness adoption and with uh, technology read readiness level raising um, that we observed, and of course well easiness to use and uh, added value are very key point everywhere. Um, so then I would uh, be wrapping up, I guess. Um, unfortunately, we lost Evgeny for the last minutes, but um, then um, we will take all this input also as an input to our roadmap, this discussion, and uh, which is also uh, useful and um, um, to help um, everybody to adopt ontology technologies in an um, efficient way. Uh, so I would like to thank everybody who joined the session today and uh, especially the speakers who prepared and discussed the um, um, topics. And uh, we have a conclusion, uh, conclusion session uh, today uh, after the, um, at, starting at four o'clock, there is a return to the plenary and uh, we have um, there uh, starting at four uh, plenary session with um, Presentation of uh, Elisa Kendall of um, financial industry business ontology, and uh, some of you even might have used it. Uh, well, at least my team was using it uh, in projects uh, which have to do with um, adoption of GDPR and how you motivate people to share data. And uh, obviously, uh, in relation to business, it's a rele very relevant ontology, so we can hear about this uh, more in the, in the uh, following up session. And then we have a session summary where um, everybody gives a short, uh, every chair of every session today gives a short summary of what happens in the uh, session. And then we have also some uh, poster presentation. And that would conclude the day for today. So again, thank you very much everybody for joining and we um, hopefully then see each other again in a few minutes at the um, conclusion session of today. Bye-bye.